I'm here with Andrew Witte at the Forbes Healthcare Summit. And thank you for joining us so much. Um, I wanted to first ask about the controversy in China um, involving Glaxo. Not, I know you can't talk about the investigations there, but you've done such, um, so much work that has really rebuilt the corporate reputation uh, with regard to uh, the malaria vaccine, which you just had really strong results with, and uh, being one of the companies that's most embraced uh, clinical trial transparency. Um, how does, do you think that this affects that reputation? I mean, do you think this makes it hard to rebuild farmers' reputation, which I know has been an industry-wide problem? Well, first of all, obviously, you know, I've been very disappointed to see the, the events and the allegations over the last several months in China, and we're committed to working with the authorities to, to try and resolve this as soon as possible. I think, though, it can't knock us off course from what our primary mission is, which is to really try and make sure that as a company we're really contributing the most we can to society. Now, historically, that's always been about developing new drugs and, meds and vaccines. Mm -hmm. But increasingly, and certainly over the last five or six years, we've wanted to add to that in terms of what more can we do from a societal point of view. That's why we've been committed to being a leader in access to medicine in the developing world. It's why we've done so much around, for example, worm-based infestations with the WHO through our donation right. program. And it's why we've been committed to the transparency agenda and over the last year or so, uh, I think, led the way in terms of really breaking once and for all that log jam over, you know, can you trust a drug company and will mm -hmm. they tell you what they're really doing? And we've really demonstrated that we are prepared to do it. And so I'm determined that we're going to continue to stay focused on those really twin tracks of innovation. Yes, new medicines, new vaccines, because that's what people expect from a company like ours but also commitment to access and access to information and access to the medicines in the poorer parts of the world. And we have to make sure that that is our priority and every single person in the organization understands that. And we make sure that if things uh, blow up, we have to make sure we deal with those appropriately and we have to make sure that they don't knock us off track. Another question that came up uh, today was, uh, earlier in the day, was from uh, Joe Heron and Kovats, who had mentioned that uh, the idea that companies could cut R&D costs and outsource even more than you already have, and you've done quite a bit, potentially without hurting productivity. Do you think that's true? I mean, where is the, where is the set point for how much we can outsource and how much you need to really do inside the labs? Right. I, I'm, I'm not a, uh, an evangelist for outsourcing, I'm afraid. We do a reasonable amount of outsourcing, mm -hmm. but we retain a very substantial in-house uh, R&D operation. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that. And uh, the, why, do, why should we do that? First of all, it creates competency. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to be an efficient buyer of outsourced intellectual property if you don't have the skill base in right. the company. A Although there, the, are, there are cases like Onyx uh, recently, just because oh, you can, it, I'm you not can saying have it the can't happen. I'm, I'm not saying it can't happen, but as an organization, to be at, particularly one of the size of GSK, for the number of programs that you're involved in, to make sure you have a capability and a competency to be able to make good choices. And we've just finished a review of all the projects we uh, partnered from the outside in, all the ones we developed our own, on our own, and all the ones we said no to. Mm -hmm. And actually, we're, we were particularly good at saying no to things which ultimately somebody else acquired and it failed. Well, that's so, going to make you feel good. Exactly. And having that skill base is crucial, firstly. Secondly, I don't subscribe. So I, I think to some degree, you have to be very focused on what it is we're talking about outsourcing. So to the extent to which there are, let's call it, repeatable tasks, right. that, there's a certain set of arguments for that, and that's an area where we've gone more. Where it's discovery or it's more value creation, we like the blended approach. So right now we have about 50 or 60% of our discovery operations are in-house and about 40% are with partners. We like that kind of blend, and we don't expect to go significantly further than that. And we think it gives us a good portfolio mix of the economics, because obviously we own more of the assets that we mm -hmm. develop on our own. But it also gives us a good cross-fertilization of the gene pool as well. So we feel like we get that good experience. And so for us, we feel a pretty good equilibrium. We're not racing after outsourcing as a mission. Mm -hmm. I'm not completely convinced that at end-to-end -end of the project, it's cheaper, mm -hmm. actually. I think it's, that is debatable. It clearly is a risk shifter. So if you have uh, lower levels of expectation on an asset and you can outsource it and get somebody to take some of that risk, for sure, 
Um, but really, at the end of the day, if you have a high confidence in the asset, you're probably better off for your shareholders for you to keep it in-house. So I think it's a relatively complex space. For us, we feel like we're in a good place right now. Not going to change very much. Mm -hmm. Which pipeline product are you most excited about right now? Well, that's a good question. So we have a bunch literally just launching. Mm -hmm. So we've just launched the MEK inhibitor and the BRAF inhibitor mm -hmm. in melanoma. We've just launched dolotegravir for HIV and we're about to launch Brio in COPD. So we've got mm -hmm. four big launches. Right. We have a Noro, which is the second, first double bronchodilator, second drug for us for COPD this year at FDA. Right. So some very exciting stuff late stage. If I look then into the pipeline, we're waiting for more data on the MACE 3 uh, therapeutic vaccine. Mm -hmm. We've had the first data, which wasn't was what we wanted. But it was one of a whole set of data points coming forward. So I think program still runs, and I, we want to see what the rest of the data looks like. Deraplidib data is coming soon. Big opportunity potentially in cardiovascular. Those two have always been If that been doesn't work, we'll be pretty much rolling snake eyes across the industry for CV, aside from the PCSK9. Pretty much, pretty much. Now, having said that, both MACE 3 and Deraplidib have always been somewhat wild cards because we've known they've been high-risk projects, but they're both coming through in the next few months. And then we have very exciting new uh, monoclonal uh, mepoluzumab for mm -hmm. severe asthma. Looks very interesting. Uh, the PHI program for anemia looks very, very interesting. And then a whole series of uh, new vaccines coming through. So, so the pipeline looks excellent in the super late stage. We've got a nice batch of products coming through over the next two or three years. Uh, and then some of the early stuff coming through, through from the Discovery Performance Units also uh, look, look good.